Welcome to the first chemistry vodcast for the school year. It covers chapter one, an introduction to the science of chemistry and a review of the scientific method. Every time you start a vodcast, have your PowerPoint notes. This will, yours will be yellow, mine's white. Yours will be yellow and the lecture outline that you see with sort of a skeleton framework, you'll fill in the gaps as we proceed with this PowerPoint that I'm narrating as the little floating head at the bottom right of your screen. So this chapter will cover in the first part things about the ozone layer, but it's not so much facts that you need to memorize about this environmental problem as it is sort of the process by which we look at problems in chemistry and how do we try to solve them. We'll also discuss in this podcast what is matter as defined by its mass and its volume. So have something to write with, and remember you can stop the vodcast at any time to catch up. You can rewind it or go back and take a look at concepts that I might have been going a little bit too fast for, and it shouldn't take any longer than about 10 minutes. When you burn a match or when you burn in our candle lab a candle, you notice that the quantity of the matter that you started with seems to be disappearing. So you're asking yourself, like, where might it have gone? How could you account for the change in mass, say, for example, of a burning candle? Where is that matter that appears to have been lost? Well, to answer this question and the process by which we answer these questions, we're going to study two chemicals and their interaction. Uh, I'd say two decades ago it was a fairly serious environmental issue. These days an even bigger one has risen, of course, global warming. But there is a layer in the atmosphere called the ozone layer. And it protects us from what these kids are protecting themselves from, ultraviolet radiation. So you see them all before their hike or in the middle of their hike, they're fixing up their skin sunscreen levels. And the reason why their protection is necessary is because the ozone layer up in the atmosphere normally would protect us from ultraviolet radiation. Now if you notice, this box in yellow with the black font will match section Roman numeral 1A on page 1 of your PowerPoint notes. And you should be filling in information now anytime you see gaps on the PowerPoint notes. So ozone protects us from ultraviolet radiation. If it didn't, the ultraviolet radiation that gets in it can often cause things like skin cancer. From minor blemishes like I have, being a fair-haired Northern European, to melanomas, which could be deadly serious. Ultraviolet radiation is also very harmful to plants and the food chain. And so what the ozone layer did, or does, is protect us from these impacts of ultraviolet radiation. Let's take a closer look at ozone. So I've circled in red the three atoms in this ball and stick model that make up O3, ozone. It's a element, oxygen. It's an allotrope of oxygen. We'll talk about that in another chapter. But it's instead of a two molecule like the oxygen we breathe, there's a three atoms in this molecule, not two. Where does the ozone layer exist? Well, if you look at this diagram that roughly matches what's on your PowerPoint notes, you can see that it's going to be at the top of the stratosphere. Now, looking at it from the side or looking at it from the top down, the ozone layer is going to be thickest at the equator. The, where we're having the most problem is over the South Pole. There's a kind of a hole that develops there, and it also impacts to some extent Australians. So when you look at the Earth from the side, our habitat where we hang out is in this troposphere, and you can see right above it in that stratosphere is that protective layer of ozone that at the poles, especially at the South Pole, is being uh, thinned or getting less. It serves as a shield against both the B and the C types of ultraviolet radiation. If it did not, life as we know it on Earth would probably not exist. And how it forms is in a process shown in this diagram here. An O2 molecule can get zapped by ultraviolet radiation and break up into two oxygen atoms 
and then a free oxygen atom can join an O2 molecule to make an O3, an ozone molecule. Now, ozone is attacked by something called chlorofluorocarbons. Like the name implies, they have chlorine in them. That's usually symbolized with the green atoms in the ball and stick model. They have fluorine in them, that's blue, and carbon atoms are always shown as black. Organic molecules are skeletons of carbon chains or rings onto which other elements are stuck. And we used to use chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, in refrigerators, in plastic foams, in spray cans, until they were banned. The problem is, if you spray that spray can, or the CFC leaks out of the old refrigerator in the dump, they're very stable, and they go up into the atmosphere, and scientists began to notice that as the concentration of CFCs increased, the O3 concentration decreased. And that's a pretty serious environmental problem. So we're going to put that thought on hold for the second half of the chapter in another podcast, and we're going to take a break to study, first of all, what is matter, and how is it that chemists who study matter can solve problems like this environmental one. So let's do some definitions. We need a definition of what is matter. It's a little bit of a circular definition. If you look at your PowerPoint and also on the screen, you can now see that we've covered concepts up to section 1.2, and it is on pages 7 through 9 of chapter 1 in your textbook, which hopefully you have just been issued or will be tomorrow. So what is matter? Anything that has mass and occupies space. Another way of saying occupies space or takes up space is that it has volume. Now. Anything that is not matter is energy. Matter and energy can be converted back and forth into each other through this equation by the crazy fuzzy guy, fuzzy haired guy, Albert Einstein. We are not doing anything with Albert Einstein's equation here other than to say a tiny amount of matter can release a tremendous amount of energy or become a tremendous amount of energy in nuclear reactions. We are not doing nuclear reactions in the chemistry lab. We're staying safe. We're doing chemical reactions. But let's take a closer look at the problem with volume. If you were measuring the volume of a liquid, of course you know you would use a graduated cylinder. And notice that the arrow points to the bottom of this thing we call the meniscus. If that's water, it doesn't have a straight line that goes across. It has a kind of a curvy line. Why the water molecules stick to the inner sides of the graduated cylinder will be covered in spring semester. Here's another example. This is a thermometer, and you notice that where the red alcohol is in the thermometer and where the volume of the liquid is in the graduated cylinder, both of those could be impacted by temperature. I mean, that's how thermometers work. You make a very narrow tube, and as you warm it up, that liquid level, whether it's alcohol in this thermometer or silver mercury, will rise. So volume appears to be uh, susceptible to changes in temperature. It's not that it's not a reliable measurement, it's just that you have to make sure you take into account it can change if you change the temp. So that's volume, the amount of space an object takes up, and that was a liquid volume. Solid volumes, of course, you know you could find if it was a regular solid you could go length times width times height. So here's our lovely astronaut up on the moon, and the question that we're going to ask then is, does he weigh more, less, or the same on the moon as he weighs on Earth? By the way, that could be a she, but I think this is the original picture from the original moon landing. So now what we have to distinguish is, what's the difference between weight and mass? Remember, matter is anything that has mass and volume. But a lot of times here on planet Earth, we refer to mass as weight. Now weight is a function of how hard the planet is pulling down on you from the center. Two objects can always have a gravitational attraction for each other, but the bigger guy wins, so the gravity of Earth keeps our feet on the ground and exerts a force that pulls down on us. And when you step on a bathroom scale, you're taking your weight. It's a measure of that force of gravity that's pulling you towards the center of the Earth. Well, weight 
is not a reliable measurement in that it will change the farther away you get from some planetary body. So if you're on the moon, I hope that you have deduced that that astronaut's mass is going to be the same on the moon as it is on Earth. That means the amount of stuff in his body, assuming he didn't cut off arms and legs, as he travels the quarter million miles from the Earth to the moon. He didn't lose any of his body parts, so his mass, the amount of matter, is the same. However, his weight is going to be much less. In fact, six times less because the moon has six times less mass than the Earth does. If you were a 120 pound person on Earth, on the moon you'd weigh about 20 pounds. So mass is the quantity of matter in an object. It's uh, in a physics definition a measure of how difficult it is to change an object when it's in motion. But for us, we can think of it as the quantity of matter. It is not impacted by temperature. A hot brick has the same mass as a cool brick. And a brick would have the same mass in it, whether you were measuring that on the moon or on the Earth. It is a very reliable measurement. And in our classroom, we'll be using a balance to take the mass of objects. Now, it says grams or kilograms. We typically use grams. But Miss Doherty will often say, go over to the balance and weigh it. What I should be saying is, go get the mass of this object. So matter is anything that has mass and volume. There are several branches of chemistry, and we'll look at the first three here. And now if you look at your PowerPoint notes, you're at the section that has a table. And in the table, it says, has blanks for naming what the branch of chemistry is, and then a description of it off to the right. The problem I have with this slide is that an inorganic chemist is studying the branch of chemistry that doesn't usually involve carbon. And sadly, that picture here shows a lot of black carbon atoms. So that's probably not the best picture. An inorganic molecule might be something like carbon dioxide or H2O. Smaller molecules, or in some cases, I guess they could be ionic substances, that don't necessarily have chains or rings of carbon that organize the structure. And that's what we pretty much do in our first year of chemistry. We have one organic chemistry lab that's a lot of fun in the second semester. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of substances that contain carbon. You're looking at a hexagon there, and it's showing that many molecules in organic chemistry are quite large, and might be six-sided or five-sided rings, or sometimes they can be long chains of carbon to which everything else attaches. Thankfully, we will not have to do physical chemistry. That study, the, that's the study of the behavior and changes of, in matter, as well as the changes in energy. It's a difficult college-level class. We will not be doing that. If you are an analytical chemist, you study the components and composition of substances, which might cover medicine or industry or food or the environment. Another important branch, and this is where all the technological breakthroughs are taking place recently, is in biochemistry. And as the word bio indicates, that's the matter and the study of that matter and the processes it undergoes in living organisms. Sometimes organic chemistry and uh, biochemistry overlap. I'm a biochemical soup, but I might be eating organic molecules like sugars to give the fuel to my body to run all the processes that it has to go through. So there are several branches of chemistry. Our focus will be on inorganic. At this point, we can stop because the next vodcast that you will be assigned will cover the steps of the scientific method. Until then, I will see you.